here we go. All right, Charles. Charles Hanson. Morning, Steve. How, how's it going, sir? Going great, Steve. How are you? You know, I'm I'm doing really well. Uh, so, you know, you, you've got a lot of things going on, man. You're, you know, you 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 run Nashville Computer. You you help the IT community out a lot on Facebook. Uh, you, I think you just wrote a book. Yep. Um, you're you're an advisory board member of the twenty. Uh, what is there anything you don't do? Uh, well, I did dishes this morning, so I don't think so. There's uh, a there, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, it, you know, the thing is, the more connected we are, and the more people we know, uh, the more knowledge we can obtain. And so I, I've always had this attitude of what can I do to help other people and how can I give back to the community that had given to me that got me where I am today. And I've learned more coaching people than I think I have coached people, but they may argue with that. But the way I walk into a situation when I'm looking at like an accountability group or a board meeting or something of that nature. It's like, what can I give in this meeting? And by giving, I end up receiving a lot more. So I don't go in there with the intent of what can I gain from this and what's, what's in it for me. I go into the meeting thinking, how can I help other people? But by listening to the stories and by listening to other people in our industry, I mean, I've, I've learned how to grow national computer my business by being on the advisory board i've learned you know what's coming ahead things to look for uh you know just planning planning sessions and and really being a forward thinker and and trying to get out there and that's kind of where this book came from we saw that there was a problem in our industry um we really looked at this and said you know there's a lot of msps getting hacked right now and we don't want to be the next one. And we're, you know, we're a decent sized target. If, if a hacker were to attack us, and attack all of our clients, what we've been building since 1988 could end in one day by one cyber attack. So I, I rallied the troops and, and we do uh, uh, scaling up. And so mm. we, we don't do traction, we do scaling up, which pretty much the same concept, but we made it a quarterly initiative to lock down our MSP. And with that lockdown, what we realized is <clears throat> there's too much to do in three months. So we did not meet our goals, even though we were focused on it and we were updating every day of locking down the MSP, we realized that there's a lot to our operations of the company, even though it's a small company, there's a lot to it. And so it ended up rolling into a second quarter. And even going into that second quarter, it took us every bit of that quarter to get things accomplished. Of course, we're running an MSP. We're taking care of our clients. You know, it's not like we focused 100% on that, but we set out goals. We set up to, to get things done. And so I challenged the team. I said, look, let's, let's create the checklist of everything that we've done, everything that we have uh, worked on over the past six months and let's put that together and compile it and then that's the birth of the book it's it's an idea that i'd had a while back but i had no idea of the undertaking that it was going to be locking down uh the company the way we we did good for you so you you keep mentioning the team are you referring to people at the 20 or employees you have Employees, yeah, we we refer to each other as, as team because we all work Absolutely. together, yeah. Um, and uh, you know, our team's a little bit different. There's there's things that you know, as you're looking at these different, uh, like your security stack, you need to rely on your team. If you don't have a team of people, if you're a one or two man shop, then you need to be in a group, an accountability group, in a um, mastermind group, something where you can get feedback from other people. Uh, but our team is the team of uh, employees that we have. We work together and our team comes first. Our employees come first and our clients come second. 
And I'm not shy to tell our, our customers that as well, our, our clients, because we want to make sure that we take care of our teammates. And if we take hmm. care of our team, then they will take good care of our clients. But uh, the key thing that uh, a key takeaway, and I don't even remember where I heard this or learned this, but you want to make sure that you're empowering your team so that they can make decisions and they can give you advice because I'm not the smartest guy in the room. And when it comes to, you know, going with a new backup solution or coming, going with a new advanced endpoint protection or whatever that security stack piece is, I would have the guys evaluate the different vendors and they would collaborate. They would have lunches together and they would talk about the pros and cons of each. And then as a group, they would come in and say, this is what we feel is the best solution for our clients and will deliver the best service. That's, that's really great, man. So yeah. I would, I would love to hear some more. Oh, I can't believe I got all this stuff in my shot. What is wrong with me? My bad. So, <laughs> so I, I would like to hear more about um, what, what you guys did to to kind of uh strengthen the security of your company not because i want all the hackers to to learn how to get around it but because i want all um i want all the other msps that are watching or listening to this to to know like what what on earth do do they need to be doing yeah well when you look at it um at, at the very beginning we looked at it and passwords were lacking some passwords were shared amongst sites, uh, you know, because we want to be able to remember what the admin password is. So if you log into this client or that client, you know, sometimes you share passwords. And that was always a thing through, you know, through the years where we would just use shared passwords, which the client never, two clients never knew, but you would right. set up, you would set up passwords and, and it was easy for the engineers to remember because you didn't need to go to IT glue or some other, you know, uh, platform to to get the passwords. And I I know another um, another MSP. They they thought, all right, well we we want the passwords to be easier to remember, but we don't want to use the same password everywhere. So they they devised uh, something where it was like the zip code of the company, the 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 client, mm-hmm. um, and then like the first five letters of the client name or something like that where i mean okay so it's 10 characters and and then they're they're capitalizing something and then they and then they always put like an asterisk at the end so they've got an 11 character password and it's it's achieving every single piece of you know upper lower number symbol and they thought well that's that's perfect because now all of our clients have unique passwords but their passwords we can remember but it's following the same algorithm. It is. So if you can decode the algorithm, if you can decrypt it, then you can figure out pretty much any client's passwords. And if you're using Which, client testimonials on your website, now you know who their clients are. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. So when when you're when you're setting up passwords now, it sounds like you you might be using IT glue or something else to store passwords, you're making unique passwords, you're, you're probably making them maybe a little longer. So that way they're a little more secure. You know, I, I typically with my last pass, I tell it, you know, make me a 25, 30 character password because I found that a lot of companies will actually limit the length a password can be. And let me tell you, that's, that's really frustrating for me, Charles. I'll, uh, Mm -hmm. I, I was just logging into my American Express account the other day, and it said security is very important to us. So I, I changed my password. Security is very important to us, and then it has the the you know it has to be you know uppercase, lowercase numbers. They don't allow symbols. And the password had to be between eight and 20 characters. Security is very important to American Express. 
but they limit how secure you can make your password. Yeah. Not only that, but you can still store the password in your browser, Mm -hmm. which, which then makes it insecure. Well, and, and and you got to think though, even if they, even if they set the, there's an HTML switch where you can, where you can tell it, Oh, you, you know, browsers aren't all to save passwords. Like some banks actually will set that up on the login page, but you can tell the browser to ignore that switch. Yeah. Well, you but, can, the best thing to do obviously is, is not to, to save the password in your browser. Of course. But then, you know, American express is they're going to set their standards and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, we, we can say here and debate all day long, but a 20 user character, a, a 20 character password is still better than, you know, an eight character, which is what most companies require. The The one thing that I will say is that um, a lot of institutions now are saying don't trust the browser or don't remember this device. So you have to key in your security uh, codes or, or whatever your security questions were upon every time you enter the site. So, uh, but yeah, you know, that, I've, I've got a site. I, I can't even remember what it is I'm logging into, but it's, uh, Oh, solar winds. That's what it is. I'm trying to log into solar winds. And, uh, every time I do it, I check the little box that says like, trust this computer for 30 days. So I don't have to keep, you know, pulling mm-hmm. out my authenticator and, Every time it makes me type that six digit code back in again. And I just, I ended up giving up because. Well, let's, let's it's, talk about it's that. Fine. It's, don't, it's don't you, fine. It's fine. Don't you but, agree that solar <laughs> winds should not remember your login for 30 days? What well, if? they're not, they're not remembering the login. They're just trusting my computer. Uh, sure. So that way I don't have to type in the 2FA key on that computer for 30 days. So let's talk about that from an engineer standpoint. So mm-hmm. your engineers using a, a surface or they're using a laptop and they tell it to remember me for 30 days. Well, but I'm they, not talking about my engineers, Charles. I'm talking about me. I'm talking about security for your clients and protecting yourself. So, I'm talking about this computer that sits right here all day, every day. And yeah. And, and nobody in your community has ever had their house broken into. Never. Never. Not not once. Okay. My fingers are crossed. Can you tell? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and you're you're not you're not gonna pull up the map that, that shows the crime reports either, are you? But uh but but the point is there's certain sites that should not be required or should not let you uh, stay logged in. If if it's non business critical, then you know it, it won't matter. But the sites that are cr- business critical, then it should matter. But the the case in point is you, you got to make sure that every password is unique and it's not just across your clients, it's across all platforms. And then you have to enable two-factor authentication. And that was probably one of the largest obstacles to locking down anything was every login required 2FA. Now, I don't know personally, uh, but I've heard the story of an MSP that had an admin password and the admin password was the same as their Gmail account. And they were using two factor authentication using uh, the Google's authenticator. Well, it doesn't take a genius to understand that you can get your two factor authentication code if you know the passwords. And so by logging into Google authenticator using the Gmail account and logging into the admin, it asked for two FA by sharing those passwords, you now have the keys to the kingdom. And that's how, uh, as I understand it, one MSP was breached recently by using shared passwords across multiple accounts. And and that is absolutely cannot be done anymore. And if you can't remember the passwords, then get something like LastPass and, and use a password manager. You know, that way you don't have to remember all these passwords. But 2FA is is crucial in setting up your MSP, and that's for your your PSA, your RMM, anything that is client facing or gives access to uh, your client's machines. 
remote control, uh, whether you're using Screen Connect or any other form of remote connection. Uh, I don't care which platform you're using. Your they everything has to have two FA. Yeah, I um, I two FA everything, man. If if it can two FA, I two FA it. And you know, for for years I've been doing this, and you know, I I remember family and friends were like, "Man, that's got to be so annoying." I'm like, yeah, but you know what? It's secure. I don't I don't have to worry about anybody hacking in or or whatever, you know. Um, and and now years later, I've got people going, "Man." I don't know how to do any of this stuff. I need to figure out how to set this stuff up. And that's when I say, well, good news. That's what I'm here for. So for uh, the low, low price of, (laughs) Um, but, but I mean, it's, it's insane. Like, you know, I, I've got a a friend who, I mean, he's in manufacturing. So, you know, Mm -hmm. he, back in high school, he, he took uh, like an AutoCAD drafting class but that was really the extent of his technical knowledge. Like he, he was one of those new enough to be dangerous kind of guys Mm -hmm. and then just kind of fell out of technology. And, and so he texted me a few months ago when he got a new job and he said, Hey, so, and and he's a real vulgar guy. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to redact some of this. He's like, these assholes over here at this company want me to install this software on my phone and I don't need them tracking every thing that I do, man. This is bull. I'm like, what do they want to install, man? Like you're, you're just like a, a training lead or something. Like he, he does something like they shouldn't need to be tracking him. So I'm like, sure. what are they duo? They asked him to install duo. I'm like, dude, good for them, man. That's awesome. That is literally just a security tool it just it just makes your software more secure at the company. So you install that, you open it up, it gives you a code. The code changes every minute or so. You're you're fine. They can't track you. They can't track you with Duo, can they? I don't know. Can they? I don't know. I don't actually use Duo. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, like, like you know, having to explain to people, like, oh yeah, this is this is safe. This is not gonna. He's like, you know, this is my personal phone. If you know, if they want to track me, they'll give me a phone. Like, he's one of those guys. Yeah. So you know, I remember being that guy over a decade ago when I was an employee. You know, like, yeah, you want to you want to track me? You give me a phone, man. Yeah. But well, but know- then, but but then on the on the flip side, like now I'm understanding. Oh, this is this is real security. Like, yeah, every employee needs to have this. And obviously it should be on the smartphones. So that way you don't have like Authy running on your computer, you know? Right. But you know, it's funny that you talk about this because his perception, his perception was they're tracking everything. Yeah. And and one thing that really we've changed this in our sales process and in talking with clients is we used to say we want to install our, our remote um, monitoring tools. Right. And we don't, we don't call it that anymore. What do you call it? We call it, it a re- remote management tool. We're going to manage ah. the machine, not monitor the machine. Because people's perception was that, well, I don't want you seeing everything that I'm doing. Yeah, people's and perception they, is you're, you're Edward Snowden now and – you're you're monitoring you're, you're tracking you're, them exactly and that's not what the tool is used for as we all know it's used to maintain the machine so we just change that little bit and, and it totally changes the conversation and you don't get people with that uncomfortable feeling of well what does the software monitor i mean i've had people email saying well they're going to install this on my home computer because i'm using a vpn from home what is it actually monitoring i'm like well we monitor you know we're managing the health of the machine the only alerts that we get is you know if there's a hardware problem or low memory or something of that nature and and then they feel comfortable but they assume and just like your friend you know he was thinking well if they install something on my phone it's a security software so they must be tracking everything i'm doing i don't want them to see what web pages i'm going to and what i'm searching for on my phone and, and I don't blame not, them for feeling that way. 
I don't either, but it's it's an educational thing for us MSPs to understand that we live in technology all day, every day, and we mm-hmm. understand the difference in monitoring and management, and our end users don't. And so if you're having a difficult time having a conversation with a client or new prospect, then maybe you should be thinking about the technology or the terminology that you're using as you're talking to them. Because yeah, honestly, I, I remember having those conversations, man. I, and they'd be like, well, what are you monitoring? And I'd be like, well, you know, I, I, let me just tell you, I, could I remotely like see your screen and stuff like that? Sure. But let me tell you, I've got way more important things to do than watch your employees play Angry Birds all day long. Like, I just don't care what you're doing. I'm only going to remotely. And like, but, but having that conversation, you know, when, when, before you actually know the right words to say and the right way to approach that conversation, it's almost like you're digging yourself a deeper and deeper hole that you can never get out of just because you keep giving them more ammunition like well can you can you see your screens well i mean yeah i can see your screens but like i mean no you you just yeah i can see your screens like now you're you're screwed now like because because they're already assuming you're monitoring your your big brother so just changing that from monitoring to management man yeah it's, for you. it's huge and And the other thing that we talk to them about is we say we we will never take over the screen of a machine without Mm -hmm. having you on the phone or asking permission first. And so, therefore, it just gives them that peace of mind knowing that, you know, hey, he said that he wasn't going to do this. You know, we we don't have time to sit around and and look at people's screens and see what they're doing. If we have full access to your data, we have full access to your data. We're backing it up. We're sending it off in the cloud. You know, I mean, why would I want to look at your screen? If I wanted a spreadsheet and go grab what I want. That's not what I'm in business to do. I'm in mm-hmm. business to protect you from the bad guys. I'm not the bad guy, but I have to think like a bad guy so that I can protect you from them. So yep. it, it's it's all an education and how you talk to the the prospects and clients and let them know what you're actually doing and 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 why you need these tools. But but that you know passwords. And then 2FA on everything. And then the next thing that we did was we uh, changed all the wireless throughout our office. And so we reset the passwords and we don't allow anybody on our network that is not an approved device that is either owned by the company or protected by our management tools. And And if, so if, uh, an employee, you know, office manager brought in their personal device. Yep. You won't let them on the corporate network. Now you might have a guest network that has the, the network isolation still yep. probably has a password, but yep. you at least let them use that so they can get internet access on their iPad or Apple watch or whatever. That's correct. So the guest, guest Wi-Fi is just that a guest Wi-Fi in any device that is not on a, uh, bring your own device or national computer owned, it does not connect to our internal Wi-Fi. And that, that's a very simple thing to do. We've, we've done that for, client, yeah. for clients as well, because over time you start getting creep where people, you know, they, one of the managers let one cell phone on and somebody else couldn't access something during a meeting. So they keyed in the password for somebody else. Next thing you know, mm-hmm. you, you've got, you know, 15 rogue devices on your internal network and you're not protecting those devices and they can do a sideways attack. So that was one of the early things that we did was, was we killed all devices and and it's a very easy thing to do. Just go change the Wi-Fi password and people can't connect. And now you know what's on your network and what's not. Yep. So what, uh, just sheer curiosity, what Wi-Fi hardware are, are you using ubiquity? Yes. Okay. And do you manage your own controller or are you using like a hosted controller service? We manage it. Okay. Is it in your office or in the cloud? It's cloud-based. Very good. Yeah. 
And do you have any advice to MSPs that aren't doing like a managed cloud managed Wi-Fi type thing yet with ubiquity or anything else? Well, I mean, it's, it's highly recommended because it can save you rolling a truck. It can save you time, uh, but make sure it does have two factor authentication. And mm-hmm. if the services that you're using is, doesn't support 2FA, then, then I highly recommend you look at a service such as Duo. And for, for MSPs, they can get a Duo and, you know, I, you have to contact Duo for this, but uh, Duo does offer MSPs like a not for resale licensing model uh, if mm. you want to test it out and try it out. Uh, obviously, you want to reach out to them. I'm not a rep of theirs and I have no skin in that game, but uh, but the point is to make sure that you're doing that and, and make sure that you do have remote access to as many of these devices as you can, but ensure that they are protected um, in the cloud with, with two-factor. Now, I'm going to shift a little bit. I notice you're using AirPods. Yep. Are we, are we on an iPhone, iPad, Mac? I'm on a Mac, MacBook. Okay. So I find that uh, refreshing that you are an MSP running a Mac. Is this yeah. your, like, work computer as well? It, yes, it's my only computer. And are you running Windows or, or Mac OS? It's a Mac OS. So, Mac. Yep. so with um, with the 20, you guys are Kaseya VSA, right? We are. So the, the cool thing about Kaseya VSA, for those of you that don't know, is they've got their, and I don't remember what it's called. I'll call it just the Kaseya remote connection tool. Um, that allows you to remotely connect to your clients from a Mac. They've actually got a Mac app for it. So I, I just, I'm, I love that I'm seeing more and more MSP tools take Mac OS seriously. Yeah. Well, we have, um, Adigy as well for management mm. of those Macs. And so more and more clients are picking up Macs and yep. using Macs. And so if you're an MSP and you, you've been afraid of Macs, it's time to embrace the change and, you know, it, it's time that. to embrace them and, and, and start supporting them because they're not going away, obviously. And um, if you're not going to protect them, then an MSP in your city may. And so you could potentially lose out on business. So I, uh, so. oh, and, and just cause you, you brought it up earlier. Here's the crime map for my neighborhood. I'm in the third safest neighborhood for my city and uh they're all blue so that means they're all safe right (laughs) (laughs) Uh, let's see i think the scale gets uh as it gets darker it's more dangerous so violent property crimes 272 so yeah property crimes is what i was talking about oh i know but you know, there's only there's only ten crimes, ten and a half crimes for every thousand people in Medina. So I'm I'm really not worried about. It. I'm sorry, eleven and a half. I was th- I was looking at just ten and a half property crimes for property for every right. thousand yeah. for every thousand residents, and I think what's the average four residents per home maybe. So we're, we're in good shape. All right. I'm, I'm fine. This is fine. Sure. That's what everybody like thinks. That, like that little dog with the fire around it. This is fine. Yeah, I'll be <laughs> all right. You know, it, it, it's funny because you can lock down everything on a client's network. You can put in the best security. You can take all these measures and you think, man, I've got everything protected. And you get one user that clicks on a stinking link in an email or they get a hacker that, you know, calls in on the phone and says, Hey, can you go to this website and and just accept this real quick? Or, Hey, can you send me some iTunes gift cards or can you (laughs) transfer that money to this account? You know, to here's the tracking number or the um, routing number. 
right? So we can do everything in our power to lock down everything. And that user can unravel and circumvent the system and allow the hacker a backdoor into the system. And users so, are even users you, are literally the worst. So even though your crime rate is 17% or whatever the number was, right? It's low, but that is still a risk that you're taking by leaving it, you know, logged in or in your case, solar winds won't let you. So they're actually protecting you from yourself. <laughs> I said that as nice as I could. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, you, you mentioned you use, <clears throat> excuse me. You mentioned you use uh, ubiquity Wi-Fi APs. What do you use for routers and firewalls? Palo Alto. Hmm. So it's got the full security suite. So it's monitoring everything. It's it's fed into a SOC. Uh, it's got SIM. It is being monitored 24-7. So if there's any activity, anything that's rogue, anything that pops up on our network, we are notified of that. And it is swiftly taken care of should it pop up on the network. But um, to be honest with you, I mean, Palo Altos are like the best in breed. So that is what we're taking to market. It's, it's what we're going to market with. They are expensive, uh, but you get what you pay for. So a lot of MSPs are going to go with a, a lower end router or lower end firewall because they don't want to spend the money. But how much don't. money is it? That's what you think until you go and propose it and let them see what the value is and, and why they should be paying more. And, and I think that's the key thing is we assume that our clients won't pay. But I can tell you that if you go and have the conversation with them and you set this up properly, you may find out that they actually will pay and, and they're willing to pay for that security especially now because they're starting to see a lot of other companies that are being hacked, a lot of big companies hitting the news and they don't want to lose the business that they have built through the years and, and just lose that overnight because they didn't spend a little bit more money on a enterprise level firewall. Yeah. The, the last thing you want to be is that guy, you know? So I, I'm definitely with you there. Um, so you mentioned that you have Palo Alto fed into a sock sim type environment. Yep. Um, talk, talk to me about that. Who's providing the sock sim? Uh, we use, we use, uh, a company called Blockworks. Oh. And they're out in California. You may know Rob, Rob Bowles and his team. They're, um, all military, ex-military, so it's all dress right dress. It's very organized. It's very well executed in what they do, and security is all they focus on. And so that's what we use to uh, make sure that we enable uh, the protection in our MSP as well as our clients. So, uh, you know, Palo Altos have zero-day uh, vulnerability updates to where if, if one of them sees a zero day, then you're going to um, have that update across the world in a matter of minutes to all the other Palo Altos. I gotta say their their website, like the above the fold here, is really mm -hmm. busy and I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I, I didn't say they were web designers. That's fair, <laughs> that's fair. Like as you scroll down, yeah. it gets better. It gets better. Yeah. But yeah, I just yeah. want to say, I just want to say that like for, for those of you that are, are like, yeah, you know, I looked at Blockworks, but they seem like crap. A lot of times uh, I know people will, will make a judgment or an, uh, a, a, an opinion about a company based on what they see when they immediately go to their website. So right. I would say, don't judge them based on, this very busy thing that you're seeing here. And also yep. Blockworks, if you're watching this, 
which of course you're watching this. Everyone should be watching this, right? But right. Uh, but Blockworks, I would say that when you hover over Managed Security Services, if I click on this, it just goes to uh, they add a pound or hashtag to the end of that. So in your WordPress settings, uh, Mr. Blockworks, you can change the the link in your menu and get rid of the hashtag and then this will no longer be clickable and it will make your website just more gooder i think that's the technical term more gooder um more gooder yeah yeah it's uh advanced english true story I'm down with it it's from yeah. ohio right <laughs> Why do I? Why do I feel like that's a that's a stab in Ohio, man? <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm sitting in Tennessee, so hey, not much better. I bet the weather's kind of beautiful right there. Yeah, it's uh, sunny and seventy today. It is beautiful. Sunny and seventy. Alexa, what what's the temperature? Forty one. High of forty two, forty three. So it's going to get two degrees warmer. There you go. <laughs> Ugh. Uh, wow. So, um, so we talked about some of the things that you did to to kind of secure yourselves. We talked about your your router firewall. What about switching? Yep. Are, are your switches also ubiquity? Yes. Yeah, they, they are. And um, so, it, you know, really, when you think about the the meat and potatoes, is you know, you want to make sure that everything is managed. If you should get some device that is uh, compromised, then you want to be able to shut that off. And so if you've not been selling managed switches and you're not looking at what data is flowing through them, then it's it's time that you start looking at higher end technology and, and really understanding how the network can run. And uh, things are set up in VLANs as well. So segmented off, they're they're separated, and um, just really looking at you know like if your engineers are bringing equipment in that can't be plugged up to your LAN, it has to be on its own separate network. So uh, when you're talking about switching, just make sure that you are using something that is uh, manageable. And then the the other things that that we need to talk about, Steve is is like your Office three sixty five. And this is something that a lot of people just don't know. And I can send you a link. The the link's in the book. Um, It it was in a, um, I was doing a uh, giveaway for a while that was including it as well. But it's an Office 365 lockdown tool. And the Office 365, uh, there's a site that you can go to. And when you go to that site, it's uh, you log in as the admin of your Office 365. And it's going to tell you, the score of your current Office 365 settings. And unfortunately, when you log in for the first time, it's it's based on a score out of like 512 or some odd number like that. And the average score that we've seen out of the box is 37. And so I was gonna guess 31. Yeah, it's it's pretty low. Mm. And so uh right out of the box, Office 365 is not secure. Now, the reason I bring this up and and why I was sharing it as part of um, uh, when I was sending people to the mssplaybook.com was to get them to, you know, pre-register for the book when the book did launch and I was giving away this uh, lockdown tool. It it comes with uh, instructions on how to get into it and then how to actually run it. But what you want to think about is not just looking at your own score for your MSP, but any new client or prospect you go look at using it for them, as well as looking at your existing clients. So look at your own MSP first, find out what your score is, start changing the settings inside of office 365 and it walks you through. It shows you what needs to change to increase your score. And then based on that, then run it on a few of your clients, preferably your top clients and your the ones that pay you the most because you're doing them a disservice if you're not running this tool. Based on that, now you have a sales tool to go and wedge out another MSP by showing the prospect 
how low of a score they have because their MSP is not looking, they are not looking at the score and, and taking care of them from a security standpoint. Makes sense? So Yeah. The, the problem though is, you know, the higher that score gets, the more annoying Office 365 becomes. And the less likely you are to get your email compromised yeah, who nobody cares about that. They they care about how easy it is to get logged in and they just they just yep. wanna Yeah. And and that that's why the company advertises their easy button. Because everybody just wants it easy. You just want to be able to push the button and it's it's logged you in and it doesn't work that way anymore. Okay. Um Hmm. Let's see. So, you know, there's one thing that's been really distracting me this whole time, Charles. Oh, yeah? What is that? Can you, you can't guess what it is? I don't know. That I have no hair? That's not where I was going. I feel like you haven't had hair for years. Yeah, it's been a while. Turn turn around. What What am I seeing, man? You got some some fun blinking lights going on here. Where's that? Right behind you. Oh, you're it talking about the like, purple lights? Yeah. Oh, that's my uh, that's my break of dawn uh, moon lights or sunrise lights for my fish tank. Oh, okay. So you're not? It's not like your your little grow room for all your your weed or something. No, this is the back. <laughs> this, this is the back side of the fish tank. Okay, so so, and, so there's another room on the other side of everything. Then there is. That's kind of neat. So, yeah. what, what kind of fish you got? Uh, there's some angelfish and there's some barbs, and um, that's that's the in, inside tank. And then I've got the built-in lighting, and it, it changes throughout the day, so it's sunrise to sunset. And then outside, I have a, a koi pond. That's really cool, it's, man. Yeah. So that's the one that so, I really like. So do you have any other pets? Uh, my kids do. You're, so you're a fish guy, not yes. a not a dogs or cat guy. Uh, we have both. Ah. Uh-huh. That's they fair. live under the same same house, and they play. Well, that's good. We we had a dog and we have a cat and our cat thinks she's a dog. So she like mm. plays fetch. She she begs me to rub her belly. Um she hates other cats. She loves dogs though. Even stranger dogs. Like she loves dogs. Yeah. She hates cats. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Um and and she thinks she's a dog. It's that's funny. It's bizarre, man. So <laughs> what uh so so I, I'm sure you've you've started to realize that I just like to say off the wall things. So, you know, we were we were talking about the Office three sixty five. Uh you yep. know that one point they called it the secure score. I think they've since renamed it. Uh like they rename everything every other week with Office three sixty five, uh, or move it around or or make a make a new admin portal or whatever like office 365 is constantly changing and i know it's for the better i do i really do but it drives me up a flipping wall man and um i am a g suite user and i have been now for i want to say over a year and it's it's the longest that it might be over two years actually charles and it's the longest that i've stayed on on a product uh almost so so i don't know how much you know about me but i'm i'm that guy i'm that guy okay i'm the one that changes something within my business i used to anyway every three to six months so Mm -hmm. i'd swap out an rmm or a psa or or something every three to six months and the reason i would do that uh and it, it took me years to actually um realized the true reason I was doing it. I was afraid to go out and sell. 
I didn't want to go out and talk to prospects and potential clients. So I would give myself busy work. I would, okay. uh, Oh, I'll switch from uh Kaseya to, uh, what did I, I, I mean, I literally, I tried every RMM at least twice, every okay. single one, man. I, I, I would switch from, you know, uh, center stage to Kaseya to, uh, gosh, what was it before it was continuum? Was it Zenith? Yeah. Zenith info. Like I tried them all, man. Yeah. I, I, I was on every iteration of Hound Dog. <laughs> so, you know, Hound Dog, GFI Max, uh, Logic Now, and now SolarWinds. Like, I, I've, I've been on every iter, and I'm on, I'm on SolarWinds now. I've been on it for, uh, I want to say, six or seven months now. Before that, I was on Kaseya for a year, two years. Like, I was on, I'm, I'm doing really well now. I, uh, I have, I have that problem under control. <laughs> I think I think you left out level platforms. Oh, I did that one twice. Yeah. Okay. I, oh, I'm I'm not kidding when I say I did every one of them twice. <laughs> people, even the some crappy people ones. Probably, uh, people probably don't even know some of these names. Well, you know the the sad thing is is like is level platforms is managed workplace still even a thing? Because like it got sold off from level to AVG to something else, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't even know. Um, I, I almost, there. I almost feel bad for that product because it really wasn't a bad product. Oh, it's owned by Barracuda MSP now. It, okay. If they had just done a little, a couple things to it, it actually would have been a really fantastic product. And I think today, the one that I see the most potential in, and and when I say potential, I mean I'm like rooting for the underdog, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Because I feel like ConnectWise is the monster, you know, the okay, ConnectWise right. is. Um, so I feel like the one that I see the most potential in would be Synchro. The one that I, I really like uh, all the neat features they've added recently is Datto. Okay. Um, I really like that. They've added that new uh, HTML uh, remote control tool where you don't even have to have something installed. So you can remote control from your iPad right from the browser. Nice. Seems neat. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how much of it's gimmicky. You know, I don't know how much of it actually functions. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you brought up a, you brought up a good, good point. And so I have a question for you. Are, are you still on that track of changing every three to six months? Or are you actually going out and now selling and doing what you should do to grow your MSP? No, I'm I'm doing what I should be doing, which means while I I find these tools like intriguing, like yeah, it's really interesting what Synchro's doing and it's really interesting mm-hmm. what Datto's doing. I at the same time I just don't have the bandwidth internally to to just screw around with stuff every day like I used to. And it it's it makes me sad. Because some days I'm like, I just really wish I could play with with toys. Sure. But doesn't it make you happy to, to make money? Oh, absolutely. I love making money. I'm not going to complain about that. I just... So, let, so what is what was it about sales that kept you from... Did, did you have a fear of no? Did you have oh, a absolutely. Fear of, fear, of, uh, fear of rejection. It's the same reason I didn't ask a girl out in high school. It's just that whole fear... <laughs> It's that fear of rejection, man. Uh, which, I mean, hey, good news. I'm married now, and all it took was like seven months of stalking. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> sometimes that's all you I, have to do. I, I'm looking over at her to see if I get any type of reaction, and she's like, please stop looking at me. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's like, I fell for it. Yeah, she really did. I think the best one that she fell for, though, is uh, you're, you're going to like this. So I, I, I told her back when we started dating, I was like, you know, I, I really like a clean house. And, uh, you know, I was always complaining about my, about my roommate because he's a slob, which he was. I mean, he'd just, like, take off socks and throw them randomly all over the, like, living room, dining room. Didn't matter. He's just an absolute slob. Um, and then we move in together and she's, she's complaining that she's constantly cleaning. And I'm like, 
well, thanks. And she's like, well, why don't you do anything? I'm like, well, I said I like a clean place. I never said I like to clean the place. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I still give her a hard time about that one, man. Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll stay out of that one. Every now and then, you just got to trick. You just got to trick them, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So you you said you have kids. Yep. Are are they uh, are they out of the house? Are they in the house? Uh, I'd like for them to be out of the house. They're old enough, but um, oh, so well, if they're old enough it. to be out of the house, then that means they're old enough to know, Dad, Dad, Dad. That is not acceptable while you're in the middle of a podcast recording, right? Oh, yeah. They've, they've walked by two or three times. They're good. They know. <laughs> yeah, mine mine still are uh, still are working on that. Yeah. Se- seven and 14, man. Let me tell you. It's my favorite, favorite time. Yeah. So but they've been pretty good today, though. Good. <sighs> All right. So uh, talk talk to me more about some of the other things that you've done for your company. Uh, well, let's 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 hit on uh, hit let's hit on sales because oh no. you know that's yeah, that's a good let's, that's let's a good one to talk about. Let's let's do this because you 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 made a couple of references. Number mm-hmm. one, you you avoided sales and you kept oh, yourself absolutely. busy. And mm-hmm. number two, you said your your clients won't pay for it. So oh, absolutely, isn't that isn't that what every MSP says though? Oh, my clients wouldn't pay for this. Exactly. How, how would so, how would you know unless you ask? Exactly. And and why are you spending their money in your head? You don't uh-huh. know how much money they have. You don't know, you know, did, did you pick the card that they're driving? Did you pick out the, uh, the rent uh, and the building that they're, they're in? Yeah. You, you know, pick out the insurance, the healthcare that they're paying for, for their employees. How would you know if they'll spend money or not? And that's, and that's, ex- that's one thing that I, I actually learned quickly. Um, I actually think I knew that one before I started my company, thankfully, was it's not my money. It's their money. And I love spending other people's money, Charles. Let me tell you, I'm yeah, good right. at it. Uh, I'm better at spending my money, but, you know, it's because then I get the toys to play with and they're mine, you know, but but I love spending other people's money because I still get toys to play with. You know, you want to exactly you, you need to get this new server or you need to get this Surface Book three or whatever the, the latest surface book you know or i'm you good need to at get it, the man. security stack exactly and, yeah so so you know the 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 thing about other people's money is it's really none of your business how much they have or how much they're willing to part with or anything like that it's your business to explain to them the risk versus the reward you know yes and that's and that's really what every financial transaction is there's there's a little bit of risk and there's a little bit of reward and and obviously there's there's more of that involved when we're talking about things like you know stock market but there's still some of that involved when it comes to buying stuff for your company you know you you could go out and buy a router and the risk is doesn't get set up correctly and it doesn't do you any good you know, the reward is it, it gets set up correctly and it pre- it prevents a bunch of stuff that you never even realize yep. we're, we're trying to get in. And and what did you have to spend? You know, a few thousand dollars? Like, what's a few thousand dollars to some of these companies that you're working with, guys? I mean, really, you know, you know if, if your client is, is like a small mom and pop shop that maybe they only do $350,000 a year, Sure, it might be a harder sell, but it's your responsibility to explain to them this, you know, and give them a good, better, best scenario, right? You know, uh, explain to them, hey, look, here's kind of where your security is right now. Here's where I would like it to be, and here's what it would take for, for it to be there. I can do it, and here's how much it would cost. And I understand that that one is too much for you after you explained it. And they're like, I can't afford that. I understand that. That's why I've also got this solution, which I think might fit more in line with your budget. It's still going to boost your security. 
uh, it's not going to be up here where I wanted it, but it's it's going to be much better than what it is now. Oh, well, that, that makes a lot. So it's good to go in there with the good, better, best prepared, but lead with the best. Well, you know, you and, and forget that you even have a good. Absolutely. So you can absolutely. just go in with better, better and best. And you can set your own standards and say, look, this, this is from this day forward, this is all we're going to sell there are mm -hmm. these two solutions and whatever you choose, if that's a Fortinet firewall and a Palo Alto and we're going to go pitch the, the Palo Alto. And if you think you can't afford that, then you're going to get the Fortinet and I'm not going to fall back to something else. There, there is no reason to fall back. And, and you know, the, but the, the thing that you also need to understand is uh, MSPs get not only stuck on not going to sell to their, uh, new clients, but they're already under an agreement with their existing client. Yeah. Now they want to. Now they want to add a sim. They want to upgrade them to an enterprise level firewall. Uh, they they want to add a single piece of software, and advance in you know threat detection like uh, Rocket Cyber or even uh, Huntress, and they get scared that you know this five dollar is going to you know the client's going to say no. But I can, I can tell you that. The, the approach that I took was when we started looking at a security stack, we went to every existing client, all of, all of my bigger clients, and I had breakfast with them. And I said, hey, what I sold you a year ago, two years, five, 10 years ago, however long they've been a client, isn't protecting your information as good today as it was when I sold it to you. There are new technologies, new tools. Hackers are coming up with creative ways to come in and, and uh, circumvent our systems. And so there's new, there's newer technology to us that's being brought into our marketplace, the small business. Mm -hmm. It was only available in enterprise. And so the banks could afford it, the Home Depots, the Targets, all the big companies could afford this stuff, but smaller companies couldn't. A lot of vendors are bringing that to the small business. And so the pricing... They're buying it in bulk and allowing us to resell it so we can bring it to market. We're testing these things out. And as we bring them to market, I'm going to be coming back to you in the next three to six months. And I'm going to be talking to you about what these are going to cost you so that it can better protect your business because you've worked years in growing your business, growing your client base. And we don't want hackers to come in and compromise your systems and shut your business down. So, I'm going to be back to talk to you about pricing in the months ahead. And so you don't just walk in there and say, Hey, I got this new product. I'm not sure exactly how it works, but we're installing it. And, and it's going to cost you an extra 50 bucks a month per user or whatever. You can't do that. You have to stage it, let them know that it's coming. And then when you do come in to talk to them about it, you can remind them about that breakfast or lunch that you had with them. And I prefer that you get them out of the office. So it's, it's, it's more of that relationship building. You don't have to talk just about technology. You can talk about life in general. You can talk about their business. You can talk about whatever, grandkids. Mm -hmm. uh, you'd be surprised. I mean, I've talked about quilting, quilting conferences. Never knew they existed, right? But, but by talking and engaging with my clients one-on-one -on -one at a breakfast meeting, it wasn't a business meeting didn't really have an agenda. It was just to educate them on changes coming. Then we built out our security stack. We went back to our clients. And last year alone, we upsold over $45,000 in recurring revenue to our existing clients already under agreements. And a lot of MSPs just think, well, you know, this new endpoint, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to replace antivirus with this uh, managed endpoint protection and it's going to cost me ten dollars a month i'm just going to eat it i'm going to add huntress it's going to cost me two three four dollars whatever the cost is on that i'll just have to eat it instead of right. going and talking to your clients and letting them know that you're building out a security stack and we need better protection to protect from these new threats and the land the threat landscape has changed the risk is higher now to run a business mm -hmm. these guys will get in they don't have compliance standards that they have to live by. They'll do whatever they can to come in and attack your network and your clients' networks.
And so it's best to go ahead and get your security stack, build it within your own MSP, test it out, vet it, and then go to market with it. So what is your approach to a client that maybe has had to kind of tighten the purse strings because they just don't have, they don't actually have the money to, to do some of the security stuff that that you really need them to do. So I'm, I'm in a little bit different position today than other MSPs back in the day. I would say, okay, just go with what you can today. Mm -hmm. We have a, what we call data security essentials. It's a baseline of our security stack and it includes everything in our stack, but it doesn't include the labor. Now, I don't go Mm. after new business for this. I went after old legacy clients that I've known for 15, 20 years, and I upgraded them so that they got on this monthly thing. So we converted a lot of the old break fix clients over to this model. Anybody that did not go with our basic uh, data security essentials, our base security package, they went away. But I'm in a position, like I said, today, because we've built the company, we've been growing the company over the past several years, so we can pick and choose who we work with. And so I can afford to turn clients away and say, I'm sorry, we can no longer work with you. But last year, when we built out our security stack, we said every single client has to have it. If they're an old legacy break-fix client, even if we've been friends since uh, you know, back in the 90s, early 90s, then they just have to understand that we just can't protect them the way they need to be protected. And I'm getting too old to have uncomfortable conversations. And the uncomfortable conversations come when you get a data breach, you get a virus, you get ransomware because we didn't protect you. And you say, well, I'm paying you for that. And I remind you that you had the option to pay me for this, but you chose not to. They conveniently forget about that piece that they chose not to go with the the preferred, right? The best solution because we gave them a good solution. So therefore we just got rid of the good solution and and I've avoided those conversations because we don't have those problems anymore. We don't have those uncomfortable conversations and, and them thinking that we are taking care of their IT. So today, if they say, well, you guys take care of our IT, you're correct. We have, we've sold you this security stack. So every single client has the security stack in place. Very cool. So let's talk about, I'll call it the elephant in the room, Charles. It's a pretty big elephant, pretty dangerous elephant. Coronavirus. Mm. What, uh, what, how, how is COVID-19 impacting your your business your local or region or you know whatever how how is it impacting your area well it's obviously impacting the entire world is of course know, but here in nashville what we're seeing you know restaurants are are open for carry out only uh a lot of uh companies have shut down uh clients that we have that were working in the retail or the restaurant space are no longer uh, producing their products. So they are shutting down. Um, and then we have other clients that, you know, we're looking at, they, they were in the entertainment business and they can't meet with their clients. So they, they are letting people go. So you have clients that are shutting down systems, but we have other clients that are also purchasing new equipment. They're taking advantage of the time to upgrade because nobody's in the office. We have a couple of clients that are actually moving during this time. And so they're going to be uh, moving to a new location and there's nobody in their offices. Their offices are are locked down. And so uh, we'll be moving that equipment in the next uh, few weeks to their new location. Uh, But the key thing that you have to remember is even during this pandemic, you should absolutely be marketing going to market and going after new business. So we're doing uh, voice over IP cross-sell campaigns. We're doing um, 
any, we're doing Facebook ads. We're doing a lot of Facebook posts. Uh, I'm looking at LinkedIn ads, but more importantly, because I have done speaking engagements, um, I said, you know, our, our clients probably need to know information. So I sent an ask campaign asking our clients and just, it was an email that went out to all of our clients asking them what they would like more information on. And surprisingly, they wanted a, a tutorial on how to use Zoom because most of them didn't know how to use it. Very simple for us. We use it, you know, every week. They wanted to know how to use Microsoft Teams and or Slack. And uh, very few of them were concerned about SBA because they're getting that information from other people. And I saw a lot of MSPs jumping on the SBA bandwagon as an educational piece. But I took what I learned from my clients and we're doing a, a series of webinars. But uh, I'm recording one on Thursday to uh, a company that does CPE credits. And so I'm going to be in front of all the CPAs throughout Tennessee. I'm not pitching them anything. I'm not selling them anything, but I'm the educational piece. I'm, I'm the educator in my marketplace. I've reached out to uh, the local MGMA, Medical Group Management Association, the uh, Middle Tennessee Legal Administrators Group. I've reached out to the Tennessee Bar uh, Association. Uh, I've reached out to nonprofit CFO organizations. I've reached out to SunTrust Bank businesses. I've reached out to local banks to see if they want to do a webinar where I'm not pitching any of our products, but we're getting our marketing, our name out there, and we're giving back to the community. It's all for goodwill, and it's all it, obviously it's all for branding as well, but we have a, a wealth of knowledge of how to stay safe how to use this technology, how to work remote. And uh, obviously we, we helped all of our clients that were still functioning get set up to work remotely. But as far as how is it affecting the business, I can tell you that um, we lost a client because another MSP was pitching them and they came through and they cut, they cut the price and they came in with a, a I haven't seen the solution, but it's supposed to be a much better solution uh, to move them to the cloud, but their application wasn't cloud ready. And so we lost a, uh, a client during this to another MSP. So if you think clients aren't buying, I can tell you that they are. Now, the prospects that we worked with over the past 15 months, we sent an email campaign to them as well saying, if you need to be able to work remote, if you know your IT company's not showing up, please let us know. And it was companies we didn't win. We ended up getting three sales meeting out of that. And we just proposed a $7,300 a month uh, prospect that had gone dark on us. They had gone dark on us. And so now we're looking at them going, okay, how can we, you know, how can we get back in there? So we sent them the email. Now they've raised their hand saying, hey, let's talk again. And we just did a proposal. So even though COVID is happening, when you look at your state, the governor or your mayor, depending on where you are and who's, who has jurisdiction, what you're going to find is that they have a list of essential businesses. Those are the businesses right now you should be going after and targeting and getting your marketing in front of and reaching out to them, asking them, what can we do? You're an essential business. We're an essential business. How can we help you? And by doing that, then, you know, you, right now you're not going to go and market to dentists. There's, there's no dentist open except for the ones that are, um, you know, emergency only. Same thing for vets. Only it's emergency only. And so it's not a good time to go to market to try to do marketing toward those companies. But for the other businesses that are essential, it's a good time to go to them and educate them. And I was also surprised at how many people uh, asked that we could fish their employees during this time. And they asked for on-demand training as well. So you've got employees that aren't as busy as they once were because they're not in the office. They have time to do the on-demand training. And then if you can send a phishing campaign to see if you can trick their employees into clicking something, it's a good teachable moment. And with, uh, you know, with this pandemic going on and people working from home, Cybercrime is on the rise again, 
you know, they're always trying to take advantage of these situations. So it, it's not a good thing that's happening to us. But if you're just sitting there thinking, okay, well, the sky is falling and my business is going out and my clients aren't going to pay me, maybe you should stop and start focusing on what can I control. I can control my marketing going out. I can control talking to my clients. I can pick up the phone and I can talk to them. I can send them emails and asking them questions. And I can ask, how can I add value and services to what I've already been delivering to them because they've been a client long term? Charles, I love it, man. You are amazing at this. So what about the clients that you might have that can't pay right now? Like, I'm sure you've, you might have one or two that, you know, maybe they're hospitality or, or a dentist office or something where they are shut down and they have no revenue. What are you doing? What are you doing for those kind of companies? Because I I feel like it's really it's really short sighted to to kind of punish a company because we're all going through this pandemic right now, right? Mm-hmm. Some of us are are luckier than others, you know. Sure. So I feel like it's short sighted to punish a company for going through some rough times right now when in four or five months maybe they'll be back up running and, and they'll absolutely need you. So typically they're going to have the the business owner, the person doing the books. You may have one or two employees. What we're doing is we're saying, okay, who who is working? Who is there? Which machines need to be on? Which ones need to be protected? We're still going to back up your data. We're going to still get that sent off site. We're going to continue our backups, but we're only going to uh, charge you for the machines that are actually being used. So if we can go in, turn the machines off, verify that they're off, we'll remove the agent from our portal. So in in the event that they turn the machine back on, it will be reprotected again, but we're not going to charge for those machines that are actually turned off. And so we had one one client, they they let go 135 employees. So we, we worked with them and we said, okay, let's shut those machines off. Once the machines are off for X number of days, we know which machines they are. We know which machines are still being used because you still have some essential staff that you, you've retained. Uh, then we're only going to charge you for those machines that are being used during this time. And that's how we're working with it. And it's on a case-by-case basis. So each, each client is going to be different. It's going to be, uh, you know, depending on what their circumstances are. Uh, we have CPA firms that they had, they were originally going to have six interns. They no longer have interns. So we're not billing for those six devices anymore. Well, yeah, it costs me money, but I'm going to take care of the client long-term because they're a long-term client and business is going to come back. And the next year or this fall, they're going to have interns. You know, when it's business as usual, then things will be turned back on and, and we'll be there. So we want to be there for our clients when they're in their highs, when they're growing and when they're, they're, you know, buying new businesses and, and, and bringing on new employees. And we want to be there for them during this downturn when they don't have the money, they don't have the capital to spend, you know, maybe they can't purchase new equipment or they, you know, they're having a hard time just maintaining. So I'm not going to build them for a regular full month, even though they have, you know, a hundred less employees. How, how can I do that? So why not shut off the machines? It won't cost me any money to leave those machines turned off. I'm not paying anybody support for those. And then when they turn them back on, we start billing for them again. You're muted. Sorry. I feel like, um, I, I don't know about you, man, but I'm just kind of like over it. This whole hmm. being stuck at home thing, you know, like I, I am the kind of person where, you know, I, I think maybe even a couple of weeks ago in a, in a podcast, I might've said, this is awesome. I love everything about this. I don't have to go anywhere. I don't have to do anything, but it's finally taking its toll. And I think even introverts are finally starting to feel the effects of this. What, what would you say to the people that are watching or listening 
that are hating everything about this and not for the business reasons, but maybe for like the personal health, mental health type reasons? Sure. Well, a couple of things. Number one, you, you've got to remain active, you know, and, and you can't get to the gym, but you don't need a gym to do push ups, sit ups, walking around your driveway, walking up and down the street. It, it's allowed for you to go outside. You're just not supposed to be in proximity with other people. You can't be in groups. So but but going- Charles, I I can't I can't do that kind of stuff. I'm actually I'm actually allergic to exercise. I um I found I that hurt. uh it, it's it's crazy. Like I start uh have I have troubles breathing, my face goes flush, I start sweating a lot, my heart starts racing. So um yeah, I just I, I can't exercise. It's it's bad for me. Well, you know what the cure for that is. I'm sure you're going to tell me. Is it more cowbell? <laughs> no, it's it's more exercise <laughs> because the more of it you do, the less of those symptoms you have. Yeah. So I'm sorry I I interrupted to to you know make a snarky joke. So oh, no, you're you're, you're you're saying get out there, get you know, do some exercise, walk the dog, do something, uh, do so something. that way you can go out and be active. But what about the people that just need to, to be around people. Then that's what Zoom is for. Uh, a couple of weeks ago on Friday night, I hosted a uh, happy hour. And I just wanted to raise a toast to the men and women that are out there, the MSPs in our community that are, you know, working on getting people set up remote. And uh, we had a great turnout, great time. And during that call, we asked for people to share uh, what they're grateful for. And, you know, and then you can also share what you're optimistic about. And, uh, you know, the funny thing is, is like, I have family that we never have family reunions. Well, they were all on a Zoom call one That's one great. evening last week. And, you know, I've, I've been texting people that I haven't talked to in, in a long time. And, and here's That's an great, idea it, for business. You know, if you want to talk to people, go into your LinkedIn account. Scroll the very bottom of your messages, the very bottom. You probably haven't talked to these people in four years, five years, six years, depending on when you signed into LinkedIn, and hit them up and said, hey, man, it's been a minute since we've talked. How's things going? How are you doing there during this pandemic? Love to chat with you sometime. And you know what's going to happen is just go hit those last five or the oldest five messages today. Go hit the oldest five tomorrow. And you're going to have conversations and interaction with people that you have long forgotten about, or you just haven't reached out to in a while. The other thing is go to your phone, open up your messages, your text messages, go to the very end of that. I, I doubt that I could find the end of mine. I mean, it's, it just keeps going and going. And it going. does. It so but, does. But, <laughs> but, you know, I'll tell you, man, I was thinking about somebody the other day, they, they popped into my head and I thought, man, I haven't heard from them. So I went to Facebook and, I, I typed in their name and sure enough, we're still friends, but I don't get anything from their feed. All of their yeah. last postings, I didn't see anything. So I liked a couple of things and I hit them up on messenger. I was like, Hey man, how's it going? I haven't seen you in a while. I haven't seen any of your posts and you know, how's the family? I mean, it, there's conversations that can be had in, in, in the palm of your hand right here. I mean, you, you've got the phone, you got the camera right here and you know, it's why not? I mean, it, you and I are sitting here having a talk. I mean, I'm in Tennessee, you're in Ohio. What's keeping us that's, from, that's true. from having a conversation? You know, I, uh, I, I like that idea. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to go through my oldest text messages that I still have uh, right now. Um, all right. My first, my first oldest one, uh, free message, chase fraud. Thank you for confirming your transaction activity. <laughs> That's fine. Hey, you don't have to reply hey, back to them. Hey, dude, how you doing? So let, let me say this. <laughs> I, I was I was in a Starbucks one day waiting in line for coffee. It was a long line, you know, back when it was normal, right? Scrolling through, hit this guy up. He hits me back. And he's like, man, you know, I've, I've been thinking about you. He said, I got this event coming up. He said, are you still doing speaking on cybercrime? I'm like, yeah, I am. I ended up getting a speaking gig. If I hadn't reached out to him, who knows? I probably wouldn't have gotten the gig. But who knows what other business? Yeah, man, I've been thinking, you know, I've been meaning to talk to, you know, somebody about my IT. And I'm connected with you. I just never reached out to you. 
you may spur them to take action when they've been, you know, inactive, you know, oh, I'll get to that one day. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. But by you reaching out to them and just saying, hi, it's been a while. Hope everything's going well. You're not asking for anything. You're not asking for a meeting. You know, you're just saying hi. And, and man, it's been a while. Hope everything's, hope everything with you and the family's great. So here's a, uh... Here's my next oldest message. Um, I think I might be doing this wrong, Charles. No. I, 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 <laughs> what? Okay. Go to your five oldest messages from people. Oh, boy. Uh, I just, I, I just, I well, can't stop. Well, why didn't you reply to that? Or did you click the link and get infected and then, then you don't remember? Wait, what? <laughs> did you click the link and get infected? And, 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 or why didn't you reply to that message? Uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the but next I, Otis? I, this I, is I fun, love, man. What, what, what's the next one? I love messing with people, okay? Yeah. Just, just I just need to preface that. Just off. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I like why are people texting me about about voting stuff? Like that's that's the thing that I think uh may upset me the most. Well, oh, you know, and- you, you, let, let me share this tip with you. You know you can you can hover over that message and hit, you know, or click on it and hold it and then forward it to spam uh oh, i know seven I, seven two six and apple will report it as spam and then they'll ask you what number did it come from and then you're reporting it to apple as spam i did not know that yeah you can just text it to the word spam or you know seven what is it spam s p uh so it's seven 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 two six, yeah. Seven seven two six. You text the message to them. Apple's going to reply and say, "What number did this come from?" And then you say the phone number, that eight four four number right there, and it, mm-hmm. then it'll come back and say, "Thank you for reporting this. We will take, you know, actions to um, block this." So you can report spam to Apple on an iPhone. So, so there was this one. Uh, hi, this is DeWine HQ. Now, DeWine is the um, the governor of Ohio, and I've got a lot of respect for how he's handling this whole coronavirus thing. Yeah. But you know, two years ish ago, uh, they were they were really all up in my business, and I I uh, I think there was oh there was this one. Um. Here we go. There's a there's a place uh, in in a different part of Ohio called Strickland's, and it's an ice cream shop. Just to so here's here's another one. I just get <laughs> random text messages from people. I I don't know why I just love troll. Like if people are gonna like harass me, I gotta troll yeah. them back, man. And they like, read it. Uh It shows that they read the message. It does. Well, what's weird is it's an SMS, so I don't know how it says they read it. It's weird. Well, it's because it's. I mean, they're they're using a software. So I mean, I use a service called Easy Texting. Use it in my marketing, so you can text the word password to whatever the number is, and I'll do a dark web scan for you. But it doesn't come to my phone; it comes to a website. And, you know, so, so, uh, I, I do, I, I, I am just going to repeat one more time. I love, I love trolling unrequested communications. Sure. Uh, the ones I love trolling the most, and I haven't gotten them very much lately 
I feel like maybe I got blacklisted because they got sick of me. Uh, those, the, hello, this is Microsoft technical support. You know, like those, those mm-hmm. people, like yeah. I haven't, or, or the IRS who, who just issued a, a warrant for my arrest. That one was my favorite. I actually recorded that on zoom and I posted it up on YouTube uh, where, where it was the IRS and it was me on the phone with the IRS, obviously not the IRS. And, and I had a bunch of my buddies in zoom, other MSPs. And I'm just recording myself have this conversation. And, uh, and at one point I was so, I was so distraught in that call that, uh, that I shot myself. I committed suicide on the phone call with the support rep. Oh my God. And, uh, and and then one of the other MSPs, then like fifteen minutes later, twenty minutes later, calls that same number, and they're like, "Yeah, hi, this is Detective So and So from the FBI. Oh we see God. that we see that this is the last number that this person was speaking with." <laughs> oh, we we had a great time, man. But like. <laughs> we uh That's we ended crazy. up they shut down that number because of us which means oh, all sure. the, they didn't want to attract right and yeah. and the best part is they were leaving voicemails so like they left me a voicemail and asked me to call them back so that's mm-hmm. so that's what i did i called them back and then you know i, I went through the whole thing shot myself and I, I played i played an audio clip of a of a shotgun going off for my computer and then oh just started, just started like moaning and crying. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we just, we just love screw with those guys, but I haven't had any opportunities lately, man. Well, they probably took you off the, they're like, well, this guy's dead. Take him out of the database. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know what, a, like they just stopped calling me and all the other MSPs. I think they finally got fed up with with like us because like some of us will will like have a vm ready ready to go and like some of us were were smart enough to i i wasn't but some of us were smart enough to get these guys to give over remote control of their computers Mm -hmm. uh oh Oh I've, i've just i've just seen some really wacky things happen on these calls man um have you have you been hearing much about these types of calls lately not lately no, I feel like I, that's. I did, I did see there, there was like a CNN report or something. I, I saw somebody's post is Scott Beck, Scott D Beck on LinkedIn mm-hmm. had posted a video recording of a guy that actually infiltrated the uh, the crime ring and put cameras in their offices, took over the cameras in their offices, and then was talking to the guy while he's on the phone. And he's like, why are you doing this? And he's like, well, I'm not. He said, yeah, I see that you're doing that on your screen. Like he infiltrated them and, and showed the inside of what, what it looked like from the scammers perspective. Oh, it's so, so great. Oh, it was, it was, was awesome. So great. So Scott D Beck, I don't know if you're connected with him or not on, on LinkedIn, but he posted I think it. I am, it, yeah. it, it. It's on his LinkedIn. Um, but I'll tell you something that I do and, and you know, I've, I've posted stuff on uh, Craigslist. And Craigslist is like notorious for scammers saying, Hey, can you ship that to me? You know, oh, I'll those... send you this money and, and all this stuff. And, or, you know, I, I'm, I'm posting this, you know, I'm asking for a friend, can you email him at this email address? And so they're trying to fish for your email address. So what I started doing is when I post something on Craigslist is I'll put, uh, I, I start out with hackers and scammers I will report your email and or phone number to ic3.gov. Leave me alone mm-hmm. and I'll leave you alone. And I get no scams. I get nobody bother me because it's too much work for them to go set up a new number and a new email address. And it's so easy to just file a complaint and get their number shut down. So I've had those Microsoft guys that say, you know, call me back on this number. I just go report their number. I file a complaint. And within a couple of hours, now this is pre-COVID, uh, within a couple of hours, that number is no longer active huh. because, because the, you know, the FBI goes in and shuts it down. 
they see the crime, they, they've got, they've got a system where they can just go shut down that number. That's really awesome. So I, I don't feel like I've seen too many uh, Nigerian princes offering me $9 million lately either. Yeah, no, those, those are few and far between anymore. So it's, it's really all about hacking the MSPs, hacking their tools and getting access to our clients. Yeah. Which is, which is totally why I wrote the book and said, you know what, we need to do a better job of protecting ourselves, putting our oxygen mask on first, and then going to help our clients by putting theirs on. So it's, it's pretty simple, really, if you just take the time. It, it, it's, it's not simple. It's time consuming. But it's if you have the list of everything that you need to lock down, then it's it's easy it's easier and and here's the thing and and i open this up to anybody that gets the book uh if you find something that i left open that i did not include in the checklist please let me know i'll not only revise the book i'll give you kudos for it as well as i'll lock it down within my msp because you know i've got a great team of guys that have come in and 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 worked together in doing this, but if my checklist isn't complete, by all means, let me know, because this is a community thing. It's, it's something for our community, and if you can help me or tell me what was missed, then you're helping your fellow MSPs. Thanks, man, and and I'm going to put a link to the book in the, in the description below, so that way if anybody is interested in picking up a copy of that, it'll be real easy to get. Yeah, um, cool. I appreciate that. Is there anything else that, that you want to share for MSPs? You know, if, if you're experiencing a slowdown right now, if you've come through this wave of everybody working from home and your support tickets are down, a couple of things to be thinking about. Number one, you know, get the book. And, and I'm not trying to just make money off the book. I, I really want people to invest in protecting themselves and if you if i give you the book and and it's an ebook and it's a download and and all you got to do is dump in your email address you're not going to read the book you're going to download it and it's going to sit there and it's going to take up storage on your hard drive or, or on your ssd drive if you buy the book you pick it up, you get a physical copy of it, you open it up and, and you thumb through here and what you'll see is enable two factor authentication and then it's got a checklist and, and you write down what your actual, you know, who's your DNS provider? Who's your, you know, what's your accounting portal? Who's hosting your DNS? Who's your website provider? Who does your dark web? What about your VoIP portal? Isn't it two-factor? Everything has to be two-factor. And this gives you the complete list. <clears throat> Cloud controller, Wi-Fi, right? Two-factor authentication. And it's page after page. And, and that's not all the text of the book. Obviously, that's just the checklist. And then it, it goes on to talk about other things. Uh, it talks about how to hire a true MSSP partnership. It talks a little bit about compliance. Uh, it talks about the threats that are actually there. But the, the thing that you have to remember that right now, if you're experiencing a slowdown within your MSP, then it is time to take action, lock down your MSP, get ready to go to market with your security stack. It talks about what should be included in your security stack. It's up to you to enable, you know, your team members to go out and, and look at these things and evaluate them, but get your team to help you or your accountability group or your mentors, your peers, whatever, work with them and say, hey, what are you using in your stack? Build out your stack, put it in your MSP, and then get it ready to go to market. And, and when I say go to market, I'm not saying if it costs you $4, or if your stack costs you 12, go sell it for 15. You oh, need to be getting 65, 65 to 70% gross profit margin on this stuff. Mm -hmm. Your clients don't know what they should be paying for security. Other MSPs aren't selling it. Get 70 points on it so that you can train your staff. The other thing is what we're focused on right now is we're doing training. I've got my guys going through Windows Azure training. They're getting their certifications. Uh, we're going through Microsoft Teams trainings. We're, they're getting their certs on that. 
they're they're going through some of the younger engineers are getting their uh, network plus or security plus so we're taking this time where we have less tickets and we're letting guys spend an entire day or two days going through training and then get a certification and um, you know right now is the time to train up your people and invest in them while they can afford and you can afford to have the time for them to spend training usually we're busy we're, we're taking tickets we never have time to, to read we never have time to, to look at books we never have time to study or test put test environments in place if you're not busy as an msp now is the time to be focused on educating your team and building out your security stack and locking down your msp Wonderful. Charles, thanks so much for, for hopping on here and doing this with me, man. Yeah, Steve, um, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Guys, uh, like I said, check out the description below. I think I'm going to figure out how to put a card up here-ish on YouTube so that way you can easily – yeah, here, here, there, uh, that way. Uh, <laughs> that way you can click on it, and it will uh, it will just make it real easy for you to get to his book. So thanks, Charles. Thanks everyone for watching and I hope I hope you all stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane and I'll catch you guys on the next one. We'll see you.